A special thank you to Nevada Energy for continuing to sponsor these forums to educate the public on important issues happening in our community. January is Human Trafficking Prevention Month. This is especially an issue in Las Vegas as the Justice Department has identified Las Vegas as one of 17 cities most likely to be a destination for human trafficking victims. In recognition of National Human Trafficking Awareness Month, we invite to the podium Erin Kaufman, the program coordinator of Seeds of Hope. She will discuss the recent efforts to combat human trafficking in Las Vegas. Thank you, Erin. Well, it's nice to um, be with people, first and foremost. Um, and it's great that uh, you've all shown up today uh, as, we, as we come together as a community to talk about some tough issues and then to, to figure out how we can be part of the solution and not be part of the problem. So today, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna share some facts and figures and they're gonna be here on the, uh, on the projected on the screens here. I'm, I'm gonna share some facts and figures and then um, Captain Lisa Barnes, who's actually the county coordinator here for the Salvation Army, she's gonna share uh, a, little, a little bit more how it works. But today I'm gonna share specifically, we're gonna talk about human trafficking, and I'll pay attention to my notes here so I don't have my back to you. But I'm gonna talk about human trafficking defined. We're gonna talk about myths and facts of human trafficking because I know we have these ideas of what it is. We come with biases, confirmation bias that we think and, and I'm sharing this because this is how I was maybe 10 years ago. I had an idea what a human trafficker looked like, acted like, and I found myself that I was misinformed. So uh, the, the hope today is that we will be better informed. We will um, understand how does hu human trafficking happen, how is one trafficked, um, understanding the survivor a little bit and how to communicate with them. We're gonna look at the big picture, how human trafficking looks globally, and then how it looks in, Park County, then we'll touch on the Salvation Army as a whole, because we are an international organization in 131 countries. What does human trafficking look like as an uh, international organization? And then what does it look like here in Las Vegas in the program that we have, which is called the Salvation Army Seeds of Hope program? And then we'll touch uh, briefly on what we can do um, as a community. So human trafficking defined, and then at the end also, um, if you have any questions, there'll be uh, opportunity at the end for you to ask questions, comment, um, anything that you feel led to discuss. We're here and, and hopefully we can come to some answers together. So human trafficking, labor trafficking is the recruitment, harboring, transportation, provision, or obtaining of a person for labor or services through the use of force, fraud, or coercion. And those are three words that are um, thread throughout human trafficking, both labor and sex. It has to happen through force, and it has to happen through fraud, and it has to happen through coercion. So human tra trafficking, labor trafficking specifically, uh, we will have, we have quite a few folks that are um, in servitude where their IDs have been taken, they've been brought here with promises, and they uh, are stuck, and we, we help them get out of labor trafficking. Now sex trafficking is also the recruitment, harboring, transportation, provision, obtaining, patronizing or soliciting of a person for the purposes of a commercial sex act in which the commercial sec sex act is induced by, again, force, fraud, or coercion, or in which the person induced to perform such an act is not 18 years or older. So talking a little bit about force, fraud, or coercion, we're gonna discuss what that looks like. Force is a threat of serious harm or physical restraint against any person. Fraud is any scheme, plan, or pattern intended to cause a person to believe that failure per to perform an act would result in serious harm or physical restraint against any person. And coercion is the abuse or threatened abuse of the legal process. And the term commercial sex act means any sex act on account of which anything of value, doesn't even have to be money, it could be rent, it could be food, it could be drugs, anything of value is given to are received by any person. Th those are some of the definitions. We're gonna look a little more specifically at force. So force is what we know is the beating or slapping, beating with objects, burning, a sexual assault, rape, gang rape, 
confinement, and sexual res restraint. That's what force looks like in trafficking, holding someone against their will, uh, having them in a place, and, and restraining them. And these are really tough subjects, and I know that, but we have to get to the tough subjects to understand how we can be part of the solution. Now, fraud, this is something that the pimps or perpetrators or traffickers use. They get false promises. If you come with me, you're going to have a great life. And, and I'll share uh, a, a story later on how fraud is used um, by the, the pimps and, the, and the, the persecutors. But false promises, deceitful, enticing, and affectionate behavior. I will love you if you do this for me. Lying about working conditions. Lying um, about the promise of a better life. Now, fraud is a threat of serious harm or restraint. And that threat could be to you or to your family member or to someone you love. Intimidation and humiliation is used quite a bit with the grooming process and the gaslighting, creating a climate of fear, intense manipulation, emotional abuse, and creating a dependency and fear of independence, saying you cannot live without me, you cannot live alone, you cannot do these things. We're now going to get in a few uh, myths and facts of sex trafficking. So, and, and you're welcome to share about this. One of the myths is human trafficking does not occur in the United States. It only happens in other countries. Do you think this is true or false? False. false. You're absolutely right. Myth, myth number one is absolutely false. Human trafficking exists in every country, including the United States. It exists nationwide in cities, suburbs, rural towns, and in our own community, and possibly in our own neighborhood. Myth number two. Human trafficking victims are only foreign-born individuals and those who are born true. True or false? False. Human trafficking victims can be any age, race, gender, or nationality. They may come from any socioeconomic group. Myth number three, we touched on that. Human trafficking is only sex trafficking. True or false? False. We talked about that. Sex trafficking exists, but is not the only type of human trafficking. Forced labor is another type of human trafficking. Both involve exploitation of people. It's the same root of the problem, the same promises, the same force, fraud, and coercion. Something's promised, and it, the, the, the promise is not fulfilled. Victims are found in leg legitimate and illegitimate labor industries, including sweatshops. We've heard about those, right? Sweatshops. Um, massage parlors, agricultural restaurants, hotels, and domestic service. Individual, or myth number four, individuals must be forced or coerced into commercial sex acts to be victims of human trafficking. True or false? False. Because, here's, here's a, a definition, under U.S. federal law, any minor under the age of 18, whether they are forced whether they are coerced, where, uh, it does not matter. If you are under 18, it is defined as human trafficking. First of all, it, should, it, it is an abomination against man. But someone under 18 should not ever be sold into sex. So it doesn't matter if someone says it was their choice or whatever. It is human trafficking for someone who is under the age of 18, regardless of whether he or she is forced or coerced. Myth number five, human tra trafficking victims will attempt to seek help when in public. True or false? False. Human trafficking is often a hidden crime, and victims may be afraid to come forward and get help. They may, may be forced or coerced through threats of violence. They may fear retribution from traffickers, um, including danger to their families, and they may not be in possession of their own identification. So for them to run, they, they have nothing. Uh, they don't have their phones. They don't have their IDs, um, so there's that fear of sharing in public with someone else and asking for help. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about how does trafficking happen, because um, we're like, I would, I would challenge our own biases when we think about prostitution and pimps and what, what we may think, that confirmation bias, what we thought about maybe 10, 15 years ago, and we have that same stuck idea inside of our heads, because that's it's not what it looks like, and, and I was challenged in my belief systems. Um, and we wonder, how does it happen? How could uh, a 21-year-old middle-class girl from Boca Raton be involved in human trafficking? So that's what we're going to look at right now. How does it happen? So 
we look at isolation, um, it's recruitment and pimp control. And I need to share this right now. I was quite shocked to find out that there are many books out there um, authored by pimps on how to groom um, a, a client, a prostitute, a woman, um, and get them ready for your little sex trafficking uh, group. There's books out there that teach uh, men how to groom, gaslight, and um, get women ready for this lifestyle. So uh, we'll talk about isolation. Um, there's an inability to access support resources. Phones are taken away, access to media, computers. Um, there's unfamiliar or unaware of geographic locations oftentimes. Um, but I'll, I'll just, let me just share, let me just start off by this. Um, think of someone who may have had some struggles in their early childhood. Uh, maybe there was some trauma. Um, maybe someone was molested or touched inappropriately by a family member, a stranger. Um, think about how that affects that child at that time. Then think about a teenager who may have experienced some hardships during high school, was raped by someone at high school. And, and this person shared some of these stories with others, but nobody, nobody really believed because there's still that misconception that, oh, she wasn't dressing right, she was flirting with them, she egged it on. Um, and then fast forward a few more years, the person gets addicted to drugs and alcohol. And think of someone who is lonely, someone who's had disappointment in their lives, someone who has been hurt, someone that wants to be seen, someone that wants to be heard, someone that wants to be noticed. And, and that might even be someone in the, some of us in this room, right? We have these, these needs inside of us. And along comes this Prince Charming. And he takes you out to get your nails done. And he takes you out shopping. And you get to order whatever you want on the menu. And you get to be treated like a queen. And this goes on for a few months. And you think you've met the man of your dreams. And he, and he says, let's get us ourselves a new start. And let's move to Las Vegas. And you leave your family behind because, you know, the family, there's, there's hurts and hang-ups and there's disappointment. And I don't fit in and I don't, I don't know what to do. So you, you go off with Prince Charming to Las Vegas to start your new life. And once you get here, things are okay for a little bit. You, you go to the fashion show mall, you go again to get your nails done, and you are um, treated to some wonderful things in life. Well, the money runs out, and now Prince Charming says, we're out of money. It, it took us all our money to get here, so now I need you to go help the family so we can live this dream that we're going to live. And that, that is one of many, many stories. Um, there are different versions of stories. Then the woman finds herself um, performing acts um, at first are pretty horrific, but they become more common as the days go by. And then there becomes the force, the fraud, and coercion. You can't leave me. I love you. We're going to, you know, we just got to get ourselves out of debt. More women may come in the picture. There may be three or four. Well, we've got to bring more women in because we've got to pay all these bills for rent and food. So the stories, they just get bigger and bigger, and we find women that are stuck in this. And seven years have passed, and they don't know how to get out. So this is what you wonder how, because I have the same idea. How do, how do, how do, these, how do women get in? And that's one of many stories on how women, and even men, get, find themselves in these situations of, of sex trafficking. So we go to the total control over the victim's movement. Um, all the food is provided. All the they move from hotel to hotel, apartment to apartment. Three days here, three days here. Moved around. Your food is brought to you. Um, there's no economic dependence. The money's taken and handed. Nothing's handed back. Um, and and it's shared that that money is to pay for the bills. Um, there's refusing to allow the victim to go to school. Purposeful manipulation. Uh, knowing. These pimps and perpetrators, they focus on people's weaknesses. I, I, if I were to ask to raise hand, we all have weaknesses in our lives. We all have soft spots. We all have those Achilles heels. But what happens is these pimps, um, traffickers, is they focus on those weak spots, and they, they keep pushing that button, and they keep pulling that card out, um, learning victims' insecurities over time. 
and exploiting known structural gaps in a victim's life, like an absent father or a tough relationship with a mother. They, they focus on some of those areas. Um, there's sexual violence, um, and then the shame that comes with the, the, the prostitution, the gang rapes. The, uh, then the pimp starts withholding affection, withholding intimacy, and, um, and more favors has to have to be done. There's torture, there's branding. You'll see women with um, branding around their neck, their arms, their face. Um, and that's so that uh, that's so that the community knows who they belong to, and their names are actually branded on them. Um, forced drug use. There are um, there's certain drugs actually that make make it easier to perform certain sexual acts where your inhibitions are down. There's certain drugs that the pimps use to keep people up for days at a time. Um, all of this is part of the horrific life of. Um, our brothers and sisters and sons and daughters that are here in, uh, not only in the world, but here specifically in Las Vegas. We talk about the emotional violence, um, isolating victim from social supports, um, again, the cycles, threatening family members. That happens quite a bit, the threatening of family members that if you don't perform this, they have pictures of family members, brothers, sisters, loved ones, um, blackmailing. Um, then some of the really terrible things is that if you misbehave, they're gonna harm another girl um, that may be in the, the group. It's not, it's not very attractive, is it? It's not, uh, it is, kind of turns your stomach, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. So then we'll go to how is one trafficked. Um, so the, the, they restrict contact with friends or family. Um, Limiting freedom of movement, we talked about this a little bit, controlling of identification, threatening, especially with the labor trafficking and the ones from uh, foreign nationals that threatening deportation or law enforcement action, turning people into the police, um, garnishing the person's salary to pay off alleged debts, um, using violence or threatening the person or the person's family members, we talked about that, making false promises of love, um, promises of a good job, of a good home, um, uh, preventing the victim from any kind of religious services or social services. I just wanted to share a little bit about understanding um, the survivor because that's been a question that we, we don't always ask or don't even know. Um, and I think we handed out some brochures that one of our board members uh, created about, you know, what happens when the trafficking ring is broken up? What happens to the women or men um, when they have this, now it's called polytrauma. They've had trauma from their life before they were trafficked. And now when they're trafficked, they have um, even more trauma. And then what's worse is they have this trauma bond between them and the trafficker. Um, so uh, understanding the survivor, uh, I'm just gonna go over this, but the list, there's, there's so many psychological disorders that come in. Um, that, you know, and these, these are things every day. We have anxiety. These are things that we may, may have on our list. With a polytrauma, it's, it's trauma upon trauma upon trauma upon trauma upon trauma. And it's built up so much that it, it seems overwhelming. But we, we have uh, attachment disorder, development disorders, depression. Uh, many uh, present with uh, eating disorders, um, PTSD, uh, ang many anxiety disorders, panic attacks, social phobias. Um, the dissociative disorders happens quite a bit because while they're in the act of performing sex, they uh, remove themselves from their body. It's a way of coping with what's going on um, so that they are not living in their body when this is going on. It's a way that they can uh, protect themselves. Um, we, look, we see the many um, impulse disorders, eating disorders, mood disorders, uh, personality disorders, many borderline. They're, there's a lot of psychological issues that our, um, our clients come with, our victims come with, as we help them to become survivors. Um, the self-harming, sleep disorders, uh, many struggle with night tremors, nightmares, um, for a very long period of time. It's much like uh, our military members when they come back from war, they have the, um, the, night, the night tremors, the nightmares, and the difficulty sleeping. A lot present with substance abuse disorders as they self-medicate. Um, just some things to, that we talk about with do's and don'ts. Uh, if you 
have the privilege of coming in um, contact with a survivor, um, I d would just speak to them like they are anyone else. Me, you, speak respectfully, share your story of hope, listen attentively, um, encourage them to stay on track because what, 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 what the numbers are sharing, and, and I do have to share that, you know, this is a relatively new um, specialty. It was 2000 when the first law was uh, brought up, 2006 that we kind of ratified it here in the United States, and it's just, it's new. Uh, the, the average expert in the field of human trafficking has been in for five years. That's not much time, so we're still learning as we go. But the numbers share right now, it takes three to five years to help a woman or man become completely free of the chains of um, trafficking. So, um, so do not put their, down their pimp. This is one thing that is very important because, they, again, I shared about the trauma bond. This is someone that took care of them, someone they loved in the beginning. Um, I'm, I'm sure you've had relationships with someone that may have picked a wrong, a wrong mate in life. And, and, and that goes both ways. You don't, you don't want to badmouth anyone in that relationship because we're in the building trust phase. We're getting to know them. And we don't want to put any of their life or their partners down. Um, it needs to be done at the right time, at, at the right place. Um, counseling the client, there are things that I won't counsel on. I have not been um, trained in cognitive behavior therapy or EMDR. They're, those are for the experts that work on those specific deep down traumas. But we can, all of us in this room can share hope, um, the hope that's been shared with all of us. We can do that with them. Don't judge. Don't tell them they're bad. They already feel bad enough. Um, I'm just going to look at some numbers and some stats uh, um, globally, and then we're going to funnel down to um, Clark County. So when, when I saw this number, human trafficking has an estimated revenue of $150 billion a year worldwide. That's more than Google, Amazon, and Starbucks. That is a lot of money. That's a lot of supply and demand. Sex trafficking specifically, $99 billion worldwide. Sef and, and here in the United States, sex trafficking revenues almost $10 million, $9.8 million. And sex trafficking here in Las Vegas is a $5 million business. And that's just what's reported because it, they're saying only 1% or 2% is really known. 92% um, of women in, in the sex industry, and we're here, uh, here we're going to talk about strip clubs, massage parlors, legal brothels. Um, 92% of women in sex industry say they wanted to escape, but they had no other means of survival. Las Vegas is ranked number four in the nation for the number of calls made to the National Human Trafficking Hotline. The average pimp has four to six girls working for them and make anywhere from $5,000 to $32,000 a week. 80% of trafficking victims are female. 50% of trafficking victims, this is heartbreaking, are under the age of 18. And 70% of traffickers are male. In Clark County, these are stats from 2019. Um, this is through the uh, Polaris, the anti-human trafficking hotline number. 116 minors were identified. 114 were female and two were male. 82 of the 116 were runaways. Three were younger than 13. 113 were between the ages of 14 and 17 and 102 were local Las Vegas kids. In 2019, 10 children a month were identified as victims of sex trafficking. 139 cases of adult sex trafficking, trafficking cases were inv investigated, and there were 74 victims identified, 74 females, and zero male. And those are just the ones that have reported it, because there are so many more that don't report. And we talked about some of the whys that those are not reported. Uh, various segments of sex industry include um, truck stops. Um, we see the big cities, uh, and then you also see, uh, you know, the football games, the professional footballs, uh, adult bookstores, dancing and strip clubs, tourism, NASCAR sporting events, survival sex, sex rings, porn industry, online sales, which has just skyrocketed during this whole COVID period, um, street walking, massage parlors, brothels truck stops, escort services, and strip shows. 
So I wanted to just uh, briefly talk about the Salvation Army worldwide and in Southern Nevada. Uh, the Salvation Army, our mission, we are uh, an international movement, part of the uh, Universal Christian Church. Um, our, me our message is based on the Bible, and we are motivated by uh, God, and our mission is to preach the gospel and to meet human needs without discrimination. And I would uh, definitely share this as a human need here in Las Vegas. The Seeds of Hope, our mission is to saving, empowering, educating, and restoring dreams to lives shattered by human trafficking. And the Sa Salvation Army firmly believes that the abuse and exploitation of human beings is an offense against humankind and against God. We work vigilantly for the prevention of human trafficking and for the restoration of survivors here. Our Seeds of Hope program does that here in Las Vegas. Um, our story, just a little brief history of the Salvation Army worldwide. Salvation Army was started in 1865 as the, um, as the mission um, was uh, officially incorporated in nine, or 1878. But the Salvation Army, even in 1865, um, the goal was to end trafficking. Um, the efforts eventually evolved into a battle to protect women and children from the horrors of sex trafficking um, in the east end of London. Upon learning of the desperate needs of women and children at risk of an already caught up organized commercial sex exploitation, the Salvation Army responded by opening homes for women and girls and developing intensive, it was called rescue work. And within 30 years, the Salvation Army rescue work grew from one to 117 homes. The salvation effort um, continued um, in 1885. It was called the Maiden Tribute of Modern Babylon. Um, there, the consent for sex at that age was um, under, it was underage, so the Salvation Army was part of a national, or that specific policy making system that raised the age of a consent from 13 to 16. At that age, the age of consent was 13 years old. I'm sure we all know a 13 year old girl. There is no consenting going on in the brain at that time. I can't, I can't even imagine that that was the age of consent. But the Salvation Army was part of that, getting the, um, they wanted, the Salvation Army wanted, um, as well as other uh, organizations, to change the age to 18, but they were able to change the age from 13 to 18. Um, and then the Salvation Army um, has taken a leadership within the United States, um, helping to ratify the Trafficking Victims Protection Act in 2000. And then uh, we are now involved in uh, almost every country, but specifically in India, T Tanzania, Switzerland, Australia, Netherlands, United Kingdom, Ca Canada, Bangladesh, and Ghana is where we specifically have homes and efforts to combat human trafficking um, and, and, and working with different organizations, initiative against sex trafficking for the rights of women and children. And then, um, just wanted to share a little bit about locally, the Salvation Army here in Las Vegas. Sorry, the Salvation Army here in Southern Nevada. Uh, the, Sub the Seeds of Hope program began in 2006, uh, and we are a program here that wor have worked with Vice that have met the women at the hospitals um, and been part of um, the collecting of data through the rape kits and building that relationship from initial points. We've worked with the hotels and casinos um, to uh, help rescue uh, women and help them become survivors, men and women. And again, we also work with labor trafficking, but since 2006, the Salvation Army Seeds of Hope program has uh, been able to help more than 2,000 clients. Um, specifically, right now, during the COVID, uh, we have the privilege to work with many women that uh, were in the sex industry, whether it is the strip clubs trafficked, um, helping them in the aftercare peace. Um, and then what can we do? What can you do? Um, if you see someone, um, and, and I want to start this off. This is a, a very easy number to remember. 888-3737-888. Um, and this is the 24 hour, seven days a week, 365 days a year. It's the um, National Human Trafficking Hotline. And it is manned by um, experts that have data at their fingertips. And if you just wanna call them and ask a question, if you meet someone or know someone, if you have a child, a grandchild, 
um, a niece, nephew, brother, or sister, a friend that has someone. Um, what is happening a lot with our kids today is through these online games. And the, the perpetrators, the pimps, the, 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 the folks will groom them through these online games and they develop relationships. Especially with COVID, everyone's so isolated and really um, starving for that human connection, that attention, telling you that you're loved, you're valuable, you're worthwhile. So that's happening a lot through online gaming. So if you see any of those, don't be shy to call this number. Um, you can just call and ask them a question. You know, what, what do you think this is? What does this look like? And they can give you answers. And you could be in Atlanta, Georgia, and they would tell you where to take someone or what to do, or they would send someone out. So this is available 24 hours a day um, all over the world. Um, and, you know, I just, I just if, if anything, I, I just want you to know that we can all be part of the solution. Um, as, I, as we're working with our clients, we have probably 36 clients right now. Um, as we're helping them move from victim to survivor. And there is a wonderful community here in Las Vegas. We work with the Cupcake Girls and Scarlet Hope Rape Crisis, the RISE program. We work with the um, Anti-Human Trafficking Task Force through Metropolitan Police Department. There is a wonderful community here that is working cohesively to help with different pieces of the puzzle, to provide the counseling piece, to provide the codependency piece, to help with the financial literacy. Um, because the question does exist, what happens to the woman who's been in this for seven years? Or what, what happens to the woman that's been working in the strip club and found herself there? She started working there at 18, and she's found herself 20 years later, no job history. Um, what does she do now? But we can all, in this room, be part of that solution, whether it's we have a resume writing class, whether we uh, bring an Alcoholics Anonymous class somewhere, whether we just share some hope some strength, some, some part of our story, um, and then we can all be the eyes and ears in this community, and we can say something. You can, we can all stand up for what's right, can't we? That's something we can all do as a community here in Las Vegas. So those are just some of the stats, some of the numbers, some of the hard facts of human trafficking, and I'm going to now turn this um, over to Captain Lisa, and then um, at the end we'll open it up for some questions. Yeah, Aaron, thank you so much. And I know that um, none of this is easy, right? Hearing this information isn't easy, but I think it's really important. And I think it's important to know that there are people who care. There are people who are trying to make an impact and who are making a difference. As Aaron mentioned, as the Salvation Army, it's our mission to care for the least of these. And sometimes that looks like um, the kid that has no after school care. Sometimes that looks like the single mom who needs a food box. And sometimes it looks like a human trafficking victim who's on the way to becoming a survivor. And for us in the Salvation Army, that's a privilege that we get to stand in the gap in that way. And as Aaron mentioned, the statistics, it can seem insurmountable. Billions and billions of dollars, thousands and thousands of people. But just because something is so big, it doesn't mean that it is insurmountable, right? Not one of us can end the entirety of human trafficking on our own, but all of us can do something to make a difference. We can do something. We can get involved and we can get connected. And I would encourage you that if diving headfirst into the world of anti-human trafficking, if it seems too heavy or too messy, then there's other ways to make an impact. There's things that we can do for youth. If we can get in front of it and do preventative work, I think that can change our world. I think we can stand in the gap and we can absolutely become a part of the solution. Um, I think it's important to mention that uh, getting involved with foster care would be a wonderful help in regards to the sex industry. Foster care is often referred to as the pipeline to the sex industry. And uh, I'm a part of something called BRAVE, which is a global movement for girls in foster care to impact them um, before pimps and traffickers do, to impact them for good. The statistic is that out of girls that are trafficked, that are under, this is a mouthful, girls that are trafficked that are under 18 years old, which a lot of them are, out of those girls, 70% are or have been in foster care. Whoa. Right? 
Now, as someone who uh, works alongside foster care for lots of years, who works with social workers, and who I myself grew up in foster care, um, I don't think that foster care providers are the bad guys. I think it's pimps and traffickers know that these kids are extra vulnerable. So I think that if we partner with foster care in the preventative work, we can absolutely change our world. So I would encourage you to figure out what that looks like. There's uh, the BRAVE program, if you wanna look online. Their website is braveglobal.org. There's lots of opportunities to get involved to start BRAVE Global Circles with girls who are vulnerable and um, get in the way before the world gets in the way. Get in the way before exploiters and traffickers get in the way. And one of the things too that a lot of these girls get caught up in is uh, what Aaron briefly mentioned as survival sex. That means that these kids can't live. They don't have food, they don't have clothes, they don't have shoes, they don't have what they need, but they figure out maybe through a friend or through someone they know that they can sell parts of themselves to get what they need. Now we still very much consider this trafficking and exploitation because these kids are under 18 years old even though there isn't a third party trafficker. It gets real messy, but we can do something to make a difference. The Salvation Army USA.org is a great website with more information for you to look into about what this looks like and how we can get in the way. Also, uh, a bunch of the stats that were mentioned today were from a website called the polarisproject.org. And um, that has great resources too to how to be effective and how to be a part of the solution. And, and I absolutely believe that we can. And if we could just end this portion before the question and answers of just letting you know that this doesn't have to be the forever. This doesn't have to be the story for the rest of our lives. It doesn't have to be a growing problem or even a consistent problem. That I And maybe it's because I'm an idealist. I very much am an idealist. But I believe if we decide we're going to be all in, if we decide that it's an issue in humanity and not just those people, then I believe we can change our world. I believe firmly that we can see an end to sex trafficking within our lifetime if we decide that we're brave enough to stand up and, and make a difference, that we're brave enough and willing to partner with organizations and individuals that are doing the hard work, that we can say, not in my town, not in my country, and not in my world. So as we finish this part, if we can just say thank you in advance for what we know you will do to make a difference, and we get to do it together. I'm gonna invite Erin to come back up and she can uh, moderate the question and answers as she is the resident expert, but thank you so much for your time. I believe that is our most valuable asset, is our time, and you've given your time to be here in a subject that's not always fun, but it's important. So thank you. I will put a plug in. Um, working with the other providers here in town, we have identified a gap in services. Um, and that is a gap for any victims of crime. Um, and that is a shelter that is specific for victims of crime. Um, so that's what we're working towards uh, here in the Salvation Army is providing a place um, where what happens often, and it's not, it's not a bad thing, it's just probably not the best thing. And in, in the Salvation Army, we like to do the, the best thing. We like to do the most good. Um, but what, would ha what happens often if someone is identified as a human trafficking victim, whether it's at one of the casinos or on Las Vegas Boulevard or someone that has just in, uh, been taken out of a house, uh, there are funds available to put them into um, hotels, motels, but that's not always the best place. And they are away from the trafficker, but um, the loneliness comes in. The, the, it, we all have these crazy thoughts that come into our head at times, and it's just not the best place. So we've identified a gap um, with working with Refuge for Women, Hookers for Jesus, Destiny House, the big gap in the community is um, a, a, a treatment, not excuse me, a shelter, a triage shelter where women can come, women and men both can come and stay for whether it's 30, 60, 90 days. They can come in, get their heads together where they maybe need to detox from meds. They definitely need to detox from the, the men in their lives, that trauma bond, but just a place to come, sit, figure out what the next direction is. So um, that is something that we are working with the community to provide is a, a safe place for women to come to immediately. There, there are quite a few residential programs in town and a couple transitional programs that help. But um, like I did share, it is a, a two to five year process, two, three, up to five year process to help someone, like I shared, to go, go from victim to survivor and then to be completely free with no chains um, and be free from all of that. 
and then I won't. Are there any questions or, um, Chair Keller, is there anywhere you want to go with this? Oh, you do. Okay. Um, so, Erin, I've heard many times, and I can imagine, for victims of sex trafficking of just how difficult it is to actually say something about mm -hmm. it. And so, you know, we talked about the importance of noticing those signs, but I guess from just as a regular person, what can we do, what's the role that we can play with maybe helping victims to actually get the voice or have the voice to step out and, and the bravery, I guess, to, to say something. And, and I guess if you see someone um, and someone shares something with you, uh, I mean, if you, do, if you call the police or call someone, the worst they could say is, is it's not true, right? But what, so if someone is sharing something with you, it's taking that the, ne the next step further. If someone is sharing some information, and they're afraid. But I think it's developing those relationships. Um, Cupcake Girls and Scarlet Hope, what they do is they'll go into the strip clubs, they go into the massage parlors, they go in once a week, and the Cupcake Girls, they just bring in cupcakes. Um, and they develop these relationships so that when people finally do feel comfortable enough that they want out, they know, they know someone's gonna take care of them. Because what's happened is that when it's shared, people don't believe them. And unfortunately, Again, when I shared about some of those confirmation biases that, you know, if, a, if a, someone who is on drugs shares something with you, there's this terrible prejudice bias that we have, oh, you know, they brought it on themselves. But we, that needs to go away, far away. If someone shares, shares something with you, believe the best, hope the best. And I think that, that can help make a difference on that. Are there any other questions? I just wanted to share... Um, I am a believer um, in the Salvation Army. We are from the Christian Church. And, you know, we all have different quotes. Some may quote from um, Gandhi. Some may quote Mother Teresa. There's different quotes that stick in our mind, that stick in our head. And um, a man named Eugene Peterson took the Bible and put it in a different version. It's called The Message. And this is one of his quotes that he says from one of the Psalms. And this is what he says, and this is what I hold on to. It says this, God's a safe house for the battered, a sanctuary during bad times. The moment you arrive, you relax, and you're never sorry you're knocked. So there's people that are out there that are going to knock. They need help. And uh, sometimes you're going to be the one that is able to provide that help. Uh, get this number memorized. Get this number memorized. And, and reach out to some of the organizations in town, like Cupcake Girls or Scarlet Hope or even the Salvation Army, and we can all be part of the solution. So again, thank you for joining us today at the Mob Museum. I do want to thank... Nevada Energy for um, promoting this and supporting this event. And um, thanks again for being part of uh, helping those. And thanks for supporting the Salvation Army. God bless you.